Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, I have three things to talk about today and the first one is really interesting I think uh, and offers a lot of things for people just changing their diet and lifestyle habits to look forward to. So here goes. Post-exercise muscle soreness is common in trained athletes and in people who exercise just for fitness. One of the reasons is that lactic acid forms in muscles as a byproduct of exercise. Now the buildup is faster with anaerobic exercise, but there's some buildup with any kind of exercise that you engage in. Now both trained athletes and people who exercise regularly will report that over time the muscle soreness gets less and less and the recovery time is reduced. So there's a benefit of being consistent with the workouts that you do because you will get to the place where it's just not so miserable anymore. Research has shown that athletes have different microbiomes than non-athletes, so a research group led by Jonathan Scheiman decided to see if there was a connection between the microbiome and the recovery rate of people who are consistently physically active. The group analyzed the microbiomes of 15 trained athletes and 15 sedentary controls and followed them over time to see how training and recovery might be related to the microbiome's composition. In the microbiomes of athletes, they discovered a bacteria that break down, breaks down lactic acid after exercise, and the counts of the bacteria were higher in the athletes the more they exercised, and they were virtually non-existent in the sedentary people. So this helps to explain why both trained athletes and people who engage in regular exercise recover faster than people who sporadically exercise. It also provides some hope for those who are just starting an exercise routine and feel miserable and sore after workouts. And I think we've all been through that. Even a trained athlete can go through it if you take up a new activity that engages muscles that you don't typically use. Uh, more activity causes increase in bacteria that break down lactic acid, which means that the soreness and the amount of time for recovery will be reduced over time. This is an example of the body's amazing capacity and ability to respond to changes in habits. Another example is neuroadaptation, which refers to the changes in taste patterns and preferences for foods, which follows a few months after dietary change. New habits are uncomfortable, no question about it, but people might be a little more willing to hang in there and persevere if reminded that the discomfort is temporary. Eventually they'll grow to like new foods and their bodies will eventually withstand more physical demands without so much misery. So some of us have already figured that out. We like good foods. We're not trying to um, force ourselves through willpower not to eat the bad stuff on the table after a while. So it gets easier and easier. And the same thing is true with exercise. It gets easier and easier. And here's something to think about. When you're thinking about not exercising, if you stop, you have to kind of start over again when you re-enter and go through the soreness and the misery and all that sort of thing. So why not just stick with it so you don't ever have to deal with that again? All right, next topic. There are a lot of reasons to avoid beverages containing artificial sweeteners. One is that artificial sweeteners are chemicals made in the lab and it's better to consume less, not more chemicals. I think we could just all agree on that as a general principle. Another is that they don't improve outcomes for patients in the two categories of people for which they were developed and aggressively marketed to, and that's the overweight obese population and diabetics. In fact, a new study shows that drinking water is more effective than consuming diet soft drinks for weight loss and lowering your BMI. The study included 71 obese or overweight women who were historically regular consumers of diet drinks. The subjects were randomized to either continue consuming the diet beverages as they usually did or to substitute water in place of the diet drinks for a period of 53 weeks. All subjects participated in monthly weight loss group training during the study period. So one of the things I like about the study is the follow-up time is enough to really start to detect the differences. The women drinking water lost more weight. They also showed bigger decrease in BMI, a greater reduction in fasting glucose levels, less insulin resistance, and greater decreases in postprandial plasma glucose than the women who continued to consume diet beverages. In other words, according to this study, artificially sweetened beverages don't help people to lose weight, but rather inhibit weight loss. And water is more effective for reducing insulin resistance and other markers of diabetes than diet drinks too. Even more important, other studies have shown similar results. This isn't an isolated case. The use of artificial sweeteners has been shown in some studies to increase hemoglobin A1C. Body weight actually caused weight gain, and it worsens fasting glucose tolerance in non-diabetics in a dose-dependent manner. So there's a growing body of evidence that shows that not only are these products not effective, they're detrimental. 
They, they help people go backwards instead of forwards in weight loss goals and getting their diabetes under control. Last but not least, the benefits of water are not limited to just weight loss and diabetes. Well hydrated people have better cognitive ability, better athletic performance, and a reduced risk of coronary events. Adults should drink 64 ounces of water a day. Children should consume half of their weight in ounces. Um, clean, fresh water is a prescription for health, and it's far less expensive than these silly soft drinks that use artificial sweeteners. So less chemicals, no chemicals is best. Certainly you don't need to be consuming chemicals in soft drinks, and they don't work. These diet drinks do not work for improving your health. All right, last topic for today. The Medical Board of California has ordered 35 months of probation for Dr. Bob Sears, an Orange County pediatrician who supports parents' rights to choose whether or not to vaccinate their kids. The board had threatened to revoke Sears' license as a punishment for writing a note to exempt a two-year-old boy from all childhood vaccinations. The episode that we're talking about took place in 2016. According to the medical board, Sears wrote the exemption without getting a complete medical history on the child, including his history of vaccinations. According to a story in the Los Angeles Times, Sears took the mother's word when she reported that her son had a negative response to previous immunizations. Sears denies wrongdoing, stating, quote, isn't it my job to listen to patients and believe what a parent says happened to her baby? Isn't that what all doctors do with their patients? After all, I don't want a child to receive a medical treatment that could cause more harm. I'm going to first do no harm every time. Sears decided to settle the case in order to avoid going to trial. During his probationary period, he must take an ethics class and 40 hours of medical continuing education for every year that he's on probation, and he'll be working under the supervision of another doctor. He says there are four more similar cases pending against him, so the board's not finished with him yet, and he could indeed lose his medical license as a result of this whole thing. What has happened to Dr. Sears will most likely mean that California doctors will take no chances in the future. Exemptions will be almost impossible to get. This is one of the reasons for the enforcement actions of the medical board to send a real clear message to anybody out there, teach these doctors a lesson and warn them that bad things will happen if they choose to buck the system. Now, here's my postscript to this whole thing. I uh, covered this issue not in reference to Dr. Sears, but in reference to the fact that um, parents were pretty successful in the state of California in finding doctors who were willing to write exemptions for their kids. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. And it really is not fair. It's unreasonable, I think, for parents to ask doctors to risk their medical licenses, reputations, and livelihoods to protect their children. The solution to this is to start organizing and vote the people out of office the legislators that introduced and passed this bill, and the governor who signed it, okay? Throw them out. That's the way things are supposed to work in America. You don't sit on your lazy rear end at home while you watch laws get passed that you don't agree with, and then go looking for somebody to rescue your family's butt, like Bob Sears here, and then he gets in trouble because collectively, I'm not talking about each individual doesn't care, that's not what I'm saying, but collectively, we all have to get interested in these things and do something about it. That's the ultimate solution to this. So this is going on. These types of bills are being proposed in many states right now because the vaccination rate is falling. Last week I did a video clip which talked about, or two weeks ago, I lose track of the time, that talked about the National Institutes of Health gathering data on people who Twitter, who sent out tweets about uh, vaccinations. So when is the population going to get aggravated enough to vote all of these people out of office? Because that's the only thing that works. That's the only thing that matters to them. If they think that they're going to get voted out of office if they don't change their mind on this, or they actually get voted out of office and new people replace them, the message will be quite clear. You will either do the will of the people and stop doing the will of the pharmaceutical companies, or you just aren't going to get reelected. And wouldn't that be a great message to send all of these entrenched people who think that they have guaranteed lifetime employment on the public dole while they tell families what to do with their kids, all right? So I think it's time to get organized. And a lot of times when I've fought these types of issues, you know, we have a, a, a bill pending in Ohio to um, get rid of the mandate for healthcare workers to get a flu vaccine. And it's, a, it's attracted quite a lot of attention 
it did pass out of committee to go to the floor of the House, and the Speaker of the House put it back in another committee because he was pressured by pharmaceutical companies. What should have happened is a million Ohioans should have been standing on the steps of the State House and telling the Speaker of the House, you and all that whole building full of people are not going to be here next year if you don't fix this right now. And they would have done it. Believe me, they would have done it. So. I hope that somebody out there is feeling motivated. I'm very motivated, but I will tell you, I've tried to fight these battles before on my own with my own money. There's nothing better than a million people organized in a group threatening lawmakers. You do this or you're out. So if you're interested in pursuing that, think about that. Let's think about how we can organize and really clean up this mess because it's very, very concerning. And the people in California really, this, this really does put the nail in the coffin in terms of exemptions. There will be no more. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.